Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together in the church, and uh, there's still plenty of empty chairs. So some of you at home uh, take note that you can come to church. There's plenty of room in the church, and uh, all these safety features have been uh, adhered to, uh, uh, taking temperatures if you need to, and all, all that sort of thing. But also, most importantly, the uh, putting your names down on the list and also uh, uh, the sanitizing. Um, it's good to be together. I'm glad that we've got some of you on uh, on video, but I think that we need to speak to the people in our congregation who are not in the church and also not on video, because there's quite a lot that seem to be uh, out there that are slipping through the cracks that we don't even see them online and we don't see them uh, in church either. So those that you know of that are friends of yours, please encourage them to come to church uh, if they cannot get online. There's plenty of room here for all of us, as you can see. All right, let's start with prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for technology. We want to thank you for the fact that we can be speaking to people in our church and also at home at the same time. We commit this technology to you and pray that it will go without a hitch this morning. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will be with us and uh, that we will experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. These are difficult times that the whole world is going through right now. And we want to commit this uh, coronavirus to you uh, wherever it is in the world starting to spike again. Uh, in many countries, they, they're having increase. We want to pray for those countries. And Lord, uh, if we are to get um, a, um, a vaccine or something that can, that can put this uh, virus to bed completely and, and kill it, then we trust you to do that, Lord. We trust you to give the wisdom to those that are doing it. And we know that there are countries that are really uh, testing at the moment. Uh, South Africa is one of them. Israel is another. Britain is another. America is another. Uh, they all have um, the possibility of a, of a virus, uh, uh, that, uh, not a virus, but a, an injection or, or a vac vaccination that could take care of this. And so we commit that to you as well and pray in the name of Jesus that we will be able to get back to having church again and having people together, enjoying fellowship together and worshiping you together. We, we need that, Lord, and we pray for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Right, uh, beloved, I'm going to, in a moment, uh, uh, share the screen. And uh, we're going to have the singing of, of a couple of choruses in the beginning. And then, unlike the normal pattern that I've been ad uh, adhering to, which is one chorus at the end, I've actually got two. So when I finish talking and I get the chorus going at the end, please don't leave. Uh, I mean, you online as well as you that are here. Please don't leave because I've got two choruses at the end. And I just feel that we need both of them. Uh, they are both as important as the sermon, uh, that, that we can really worship God at the end of the service today. Now, one other thing that I've been forgetting to say, that anybody here, uh, you guys at home, you can't do this, but uh, if you are here and you've brought your tithes and offerings, we haven't been having a collection, but there are two boxes at the back. There's one at each of the doors that says tithes and offerings on it. Please place your tithes and offerings into that box as you leave. Okay, so I've remembered to say that now. Right, let's share the screen. I trust that everybody at home is, uh, is seeing it. Uh, if you're not seeing it, you won't be able to phone me because I've left my phone at home. So you need to phone somebody else in the church if, uh, if you're not seeing and hearing what we are doing here this morning. Right, we're going to start off with singing, and I trust that you will all sing out and enjoy worshipping God as we start the service this morning. Right, let's stand. Stand amazed in the presence. Thank you, Lord. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the
Hallelujah. Thank you. Please take your seats. I think the first thing I need to do this morning is um, make sure that the people at home, I apologize for the fact that last week I got a little carried away at times and I was, you know, I'm so used to moving, not standing in one spot. And if I move away from the screen, they can't hear me at home. So when I, when I walk around, and I did that a little bit last week, so there were patches where they couldn't hear me. So I'm going to try today to restrict myself to standing in front of the screen and speaking to you. We're going to continue with the series, which, um, as I said to you in the beginning, Rick Warren made this available to everyone. And uh, uh, I've been using it, but I found that, um, you know, this is South Africa, it's not the United States. And so what I've done is I've taken just the, the scriptures that he's used and the, the, um, the headings, uh, just the main headings of each uh, subject. And uh, other than that, I've put my own stuff into it because I feel that it, it, it's more applicable. So uh, the headings like faith that works when life doesn't, that type of heading is from uh, Rick uh, Warren. And I want to thank him for that and uh, give honor to him for it because I think it's timely. You know, while the whole world is in lockdown and going through this virus problem uh, and um, it seems to be spiking again all over the world. So what I think we need to really take note of today, before I even start, is the fact that this in South Africa has not been as bad as some countries. And in many cases, especially in Mpumalanga, where we've been really blessed, we haven't had many people, we can take it uh, as not being very serious. But I tell you, it is extremely serious. I have a friend in America who's, who's got it, and uh, he said that, uh, the, no, uh, his wife got it. And she said that one of the most important things that she wanted to say about it was that every time she went to bed uh, or every time she went to sleep, she was scared to actually go to sleep because she thought she would never wake up again. And uh, it's, it's that bad that it really frightens people almost to death. And so let's take it seriously. We wear our masks, we wash our hands. Uh, we don't have water in the church today, so I don't know how we're gonna wash our hands, but at least we've got the sanitizer. So I don't know what's wrong with the water, but that's the problem. So here we are then with the third part of the faith that works when life doesn't. And the main part of it today that we've been covering is a faith that makes tough choices easier. You see, we go through life and there are sometimes choices that are difficult to make. and uh, Faith in the Lord makes those choices easier. And that's the subject matter of what we want to tackle today. Uh, there are seven reactions which uh, uh, Rick Warren uh, gave them. And you know, he's, he's a Baptist. You know how Baptists are, they make everything's alliterated. So every, they love it that the first word of every sentence must be the same. So uh, I'm going to use that part of it, of his, and uh, they start with a D and uh, the different stages or reactions that we have to a crisis. Number one is denial. Uh, denial with any crisis that comes along, there'll be a lot of people that deny. They don't, they don't want to admit that there is a problem, that there is a crisis. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in the world are like that and they don't even admit that they need um, the crisis of salvation. In other words, they're on the road to hell and they deny the fact that there is a God. They deny the fact that there is a way. And it's the same with this coronavirus thing, COVID-19. Some don't even believe that it is real, but people are dying. And so it is real. Second stage is dismissal. So in other words, you believe, but uh, it's only other people who get it, you know? And so, so that's dismissing it, saying it's, it's not relevant to us. Well, it is relevant to us because people in South Africa have died. Uh, third stage is defiant. In other words, those who refuse to take precautions. And I've seen quite a few of them around as well. You know, they refuse to take any precautions. And so the results of that will be whatever happens to them, they are asking for it themselves. When we come to a crisis, the fourth stage is the delayed acceptance. In other words, it might be real, but it's not for me. It's going to happen to you, not me. You know, that's the kind of 
denial or delayed acceptance that we are talking about. And the fifth stage is disruption. In other words, our lives have changed and that will result in tough decisions. Now we're getting to the reality of what has happened with the COVID-19. There's a lot of people have had their salaries reduced. There's a lot of people that have lost their jobs. There are businesses that will never open again. And uh, so it's real. It's more real for them than for those who are maybe still getting their salary. And so it's going to result in some tough choices in the future. The sixth stage is distress. Now we get to the point <clears throat> where we think life will never be the same again. <clears throat> in other words, it's long term. And uh, it brings tension and distress into our lives. The seventh and last stage is determination. And that's the stage that I believe that we as Christians should all be at. And uh, especially now after we've been with it for a while. And that is the determination that we, with God's grace, will get through this. Now, we've said that in one of the previous sessions as well. It will come to pass. With God's help, we will get through it. And I believe that with all my heart. We'll get through it. So, what then can we in South Africa do? Well, I believe that in South Africa, it hasn't yet reached its peak. So, in other words, it could get worse in the future. Uh, quite a few months ago, I saw... Uh, or heard uh, one of the uh, medical people saying that they didn't expect the, the, the peak to re be reached in South Africa until September. So that means from now on, if he's right, it's going to continue to get worse. And uh, we need to be ready for that. In Mpumalanga, we are really blessed. I think there's only been one death. I've only heard of one. There might be, oh, there's two now. Okay, so there's two deaths. Now, you know what? That's two too many. Uh, it might be lovely to be able to say to the rest of South Africa, we've only had two. What about those two, their families? To them, it's very real. And uh, we don't want to have any of our people die. And uh, so uh, we need to be really careful with doing the right thing all the time. It's bad enough for that one family, that even if it's only one person, but two people, it's two families that are grieving about this whole coronavirus thing. So then let's come to the question. How does trusting God make life easier? That's the question we've got. And of course, we're going to look at the book of James because we said in the beginning, a lot of these scriptures come from James. We're going to look at James chapter 1 and verse 5. I'll read it to you. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The NIV says he gives generously without finding fault. That's what God does. Thank God for that, that we can come to him and get the wisdom to know how to make decisions and how to make life easier because we trust in God to make the right decisions. The next verse goes on to say, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. Beloved, we don't want to be um, tossed by every wind of doctrine. You know, things come and go. Uh, if we stick to the Bible, we stick to our relationship with God, we stick to good fellowship with proper Christians, we will not be like a wave of the sea that is driven this way and that way, uh, being unstable, because an unstable man or woman is unstable in all their ways. That's what Proverbs tells us. They are unstable in all their ways. The next verse goes on to say, Let not that man suppose, or woman, suppose that he or she will receive anything from the Lord. And so it's quite a strong scripture that if you think about it, that God is saying, if you don't want to believe that I'll give you wisdom when you ask for it, then don't ask for anything else. You know, in other words, if you haven't got the faith to believe that I'll give you what I want to give you, I want to give you wisdom. You see, there's a lot of things that we sometimes ask God for, and you wonder to yourself, am I asking um, correctly? Or is this something that God doesn't want me to have? L let me give you an example. The Lord Jesus himself, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the flesh said, Father, let this 
cup be taken from me. The flesh said, I don't want to go through this. It's too much. But let your will be done, not mine. So you see, even in the Lord Jesus, there's the tendency of the flesh to want to say, am I asking correctly? Rather to say what Jesus said. No, no, not the flesh. Your will be done, Father. So there's a possibility for you and I, because we're not Jesus. Jesus knew the word, Father's will perfectly, but we're not Jesus. And there could be a time when you're asking for something and you have a little bit of doubt about whether you're asking correctly or not. Lord, I need a new motor car. And maybe God is saying, well, you need to walk a little bit more. You need the exercise. I don't know. Uh, there could be times when there's a little bit of doubt about what you're asking for. But one thing you should never doubt, when you ask God for wisdom, he says, I'll give it to you without any fear of you not getting it. I give it to you liberally, without reproach. You don't have to earn it. You just ask for it, and I will give you wisdom. So, beloved, well, I wanted to stress that this morning, that there's the one thing that you pray for that you can know for a fact that you will get exactly what you're asking for. There are sometimes if we ask God for something, and uh, I gave illustrations of that a couple of weeks ago, when God said, no, uh, I'm not going to give you that, because uh, Elijah prayed for God to kill him. And God said, no, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to answer the prayer you wanted me to answer it that way. I've got something better for you. You're going to heaven in a chariot of fire. And so why should God give him what he asked for, when he's got something better for him? That's the point I'm trying to make. But there could be times when God will say no to you. Never will he say no to you when you ask for wisdom. Because the Bible says he wants to give it to you. And he says, do not doubt. Because if you doubt, you're like the wave of the sea going this way and that way. And you won't get anything from me if you have that sort of doubt. So faith is absolutely vital. But we don't have faith in faith. We have faith in God. We have faith in the fact that he will give us what we're asking for when we ask within his will in a case like wisdom. So then a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I, I quoted that before. And uh, that's what verse 8 says. A double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. They are not only unsta unstable in one thing and wise in another. They are unstable in almost everything. You can't rely on a person who is unstable. Right, then we come to the points that I want to cover today. Number one, when I trust God, he gives me his wisdom. That's the point that we've been, uh, the introduction has been leading us into, into this point. And that is, when we trust God, he gives us his wisdom. And uh, he will do so without any fear of us doubting it. We read again, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, I love to quote when I'm talking about wisdom. You've often heard this before, but I don't think you can hear it often enough. And that is the quotation or the teaching that Edwin Louis Carroll gave about wisdom. And uh, he covered three things which are absolutely vital to us. Point number one, he said knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Now, is knowledge important? Well, it's so important that God wrote into the Bible, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul was teaching young Timothy, you need to study the word of God, Timothy. And then just one chapter later, in chapter 3 and verse 16, he tackled the issue again. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So don't look down on knowledge. Knowledge is absolutely vital. But knowledge on its own is not enough. You see, we need knowledge. And so we need to study. We must have knowledge about the Bible. We need to have knowledge about finances. We need to have knowledge about how to conduct our lives, obeying the rules of the country and all those sort of things. Knowledge is absolutely vital. That's why we send our children to school. 
um, I trust that they are going to a Christian school because as one man in America said to me, he said that uh, uh, I went to a, a government school in America. And what I've realized is that since I've become a multimillionaire, um, I have not used anything at all that I used at school. Uh, and what I consider school to be, uh, to be 12 years of indoctrination. And uh, he said, for that reason, I'm doing homeschooling with my children. He won't send them to school. So um, I hope that your children are going to a Christian school and uh, that the knowledge they get will not be the wisdom and knowledge of the world. The wisdom and the knowledge of the world is sometimes so different to the knowledge that God wants to give us from the Bible. And um, uh, there's, there's a quote uh, by, uh, by Martin Luther that I haven't put written down and I haven't memorized it, but he said something about the fact that uh, he's concerned about the fact that the schools of his age were leading people on the way to hell. Uh, and uh, so he said, I want you to send your children to Christian education. This is what Martin Luther said all those years ago. Right, then knowledge was the one thing, and we've tackled that. And I, I wanted you to get that into your minds, that we need knowledge. We don't look down on knowledge. But then in addition to knowledge, you need understanding. Because knowledge without understanding does not enable you to know really what God is telling you to do, uh, or any other subject for that matter, but particularly the Bible. You need to not only know the Bible, you see, you can learn the Bible, you can memorize the Bible and still have it not really impacting your life until you come to understand what God is trying to tell you how to conduct your life. And so understanding is vital. And vital, according to Edwin Louis Cole, understanding is the interpretation of the facts. So if knowledge is accumulation of facts, Understanding is interpreting, interpreting those facts so that you know how to conduct your life. And wisdom is the application of those facts. So we need all three. We need knowledge, we need understanding, we need wisdom. And the wisdom part of it, you see, the, the knowledge part of it is more your job than, than what God's going to do for you. He's telling you to do it. He's giving you the brain to do it. He's giving you the, the Bible to do it. He's giving you all, the, all the, the tools to do it. But he says, I want you to do it. I want you to study to show yourself approved. But when it comes to understanding, now we start to seeing that God reveals to you what you have accumulated, the facts that you've accumulated. God starts to give you understanding through the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit not only gives you understanding, but when you ask God for wisdom, he says, okay, now this is how you apply all that knowledge that you have studied for. So it's absolutely vital. Wisdom is needed by so many people. You see, many people make huge mistakes, even if they are educated. If they don't know uh, or don't have wisdom and understanding, they make mistakes. So knowledge... Uh, even with understanding, but lacking wisdom will not will lead to bad choices in life. Uh, and we don't want to be in that situation where we lack wisdom. So then we say to ourselves, I should have known better. You know how many times I have said that to myself? I don't know if you have. Uh, am I alone in that? Have you ever said, I should have known better? I shouldn't have said what I said. I shouldn't have thought what I thought. I shouldn't have done what I did. You know? How many times in our lives do we come to that point? And you know, it's unnecessary because it's sometimes because we haven't asked God for wisdom. And when we ask God for wisdom, we won't have to say, I should have known better. We will do what God wants us to say. So then we need those three things, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. In Proverbs, it teaches us in chapter 3 and verse 18, uh, it uh, it calls wisdom she. It says she, wisdom, is a tree of life to those who take a hold of her. And happy are all who retain her. So you don't only ask God for wisdom, but you retain that wisdom. You keep that wisdom. You keep on doing what God teaches us to do. In Proverbs, also in verse uh, 7 of chapter 4, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. That means it's the most important thing that we can ask God for wisdom, uh, apart from salvation, of course. But I mean, when you've got a relationship with God and you want to pray to God for 
all sorts of things in life. One of the most important things, the principal thing Solomon tells us is wisdom. Wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. You see, there was a, a noted psychiatrist was a, a guest in a banquet that was for uh, a whole community of editors of humorous magazines. You know, sometimes they have it in magazines or in newspapers. They have a, an editor who is responsible for the humor side of that publication. And this is what this was. A whole lot of editors who are into humor. And uh, this psychiatrist was a guest of honor. And he was going to talk to them. Now, the host who had invited him said to him, Doctor, how do you detect a mental deficiency in somebody who appears perfectly normal? Well, that's quite a difficult question. The person appears normal. But not all people who appear normal have got it all together. So how do you detect the mental deficiency in somebody who appears normal? And the psychiatrist said, that's quite easy. He said, you ask him a simple question, which everybody should be able to answer with no trouble at all. Simple question, everybody should be able to answer it. If he hesitates with that question, well, you're on the right track. You know that you've got a guy with, he hasn't got all the screws there. If you ask him an obvious question, he should know the answer to it. And he hesitates and he looks for the answer then maybe you're dealing with somebody that has got, not got all his marbles together. And so that was the question. And uh, so the editor, the editor, who, the host who had invited this psychiatrist said, well, give me an example. What sort of question would you ask? Well, this is quite interesting. He says, well, you might ask him, Captain Cook, made three trips around the world and he died on one of them which one so the editor said to him you wouldn't have happen to have another example would you because i'm not very good at history <laughs> if you didn't get that ask your spouse on the way home <laughs> they'll explain it to you Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 14 says, Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Oh, beloved, when we really ask God for wisdom, it is like sweet to the soul. When you know that you've done the right thing, even when it goes against your grain, when God tells you to forgive somebody that you don't want to forgive, and you do it because God has said, I want you to do it. You have the wisdom to say, Lord, you know better than I do. And forgiveness is just one example. But there are so many issues in life. When we do what God tells us to do, it is like sweet to the soul. That's what it is. Doing God's will. Now, does our education system prepare us for successful, happy life? with knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. What would you say? You know, I wonder sometimes, and I'm gonna give you a riddle that the clever people here will all get it. But, but if you are too clever, you might not get it. Because this is the riddle. You see, the riddle was asked of a group of people. Now, 80% of the kindergarten children, the little kids in kindergarten, 80% of them got the answer to this riddle. Then they asked the same riddle of Stanford University seniors, and only 17% of them got the answer right. Wow, what a riddle can this be? The little children get the answer, and university graduates, I mean, these are seniors at university, Stanford University, one of the best in the world. Only 17% of them got it right. What a riddle. Okay, here it comes. What is greater than God? More evil than the devil? The poor have it. The rich need it. And if you eat it, you'll die. 
Any kitten, kindergarten children here? Or a little older? Anybody got an answer to that riddle? Here's the answer. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is greater than God. Nothing is more evil than the devil. The poor have nothing. The rich need nothing. And if you eat nothing, you're going to die. So nothing is the answer. But only the little ones got it. You see, all our knowledge crowds so many different things into our brains that sometimes little ones are easier, find it easier to push aside all the rubbish because they haven't had the rubbish put in yet. And they saw it more clearly. You see, the reason I've given you that riddle is so that you would understand that wisdom is something that doesn't come naturally to you and I with all our education, with all our experience of life. Wisdom is not always the easiest thing to get unless you're walking with God, that you're in the habit of asking God, what do I do now, Lord? What is the way forward? Which decision should I take? I am guilty so many times of making wrong decisions because of not having asked God for the wisdom that he wants to give me anyway. So then we come to a question that leads me to the next point. And the question is, how do we get the wisdom we need? How do we get the wisdom we need? Still under the subject of wisdom, the main heading of wisdom, I'm going to break this down into point A, B, and C. Point A, put God first in my life. Put God first in my life is the best way to know that you are going to get God's wisdom and direction in your life. Put him first. If he's number one in your life, you know, you hardly even need to ask him for wisdom in a particular situation. If God's first in my life, I automatically find that I'm making better decisions than I used to make before. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So fearing God with a healthy respect, walking with God is the beginning of wisdom and good understanding. And he will help us in this life. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. These are things that God helps us with. So in other words, humbly coming before God, honoring God, results in God honoring us. You see, the Bible says, humble yourself and God will lift you up. You know, God honors you when you honor him. When we humbly honor God, God lifts us up. That's just the way God wants to do it. And he's, he's allowed to do it because he's God. Point B, putting God's word into practice. So putting God first into my life should result in me putting the word of God into practice. This, this book that we, that we so often use um, and we read it, it's not just for our instruction. It's not just for our entertainment. It is more than that. It's a book of, like a workshop manual. We should put it into practice. So putting God's word into practice will result in, in uh, blessings from God. Now, Jesus said this. He said, now, if you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So if you know what, what Jesus has been teaching, this is what he's been teaching the people that, he's, that are, are following him. And, and he said, okay, now, if you know this, You'll be blessed if you put it into practice. I don't want to only give you instruction. Jesus was not that kind of a teacher. He taught people facts of life that were not for their education and not just for their entertainment, but for their practical living out life in that day and age. And he's like that today for you and I. If we know these things that we read in the Bible, and we do them, we will be blessed. That's the word of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, in 2 Samuel twenty-two thirty-one, 31, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord, that's Jesus, is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. 
He's a shield for all who take refuge in him. Well, then, uh, excuse me, I'm not going away from the screen for those people who thought I was moving away. I'm just going to get my, my little shield. I've got a shield as well as the, as well as one of these things, you know, the mask. And how often do I forget them? I, I leave home and, and I've got into the habit now of leaving one in the car because I, I forget it so, so many times that at least I've got one in the car. There's one shield that you should never leave home without. Don't go anywhere without the shield of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the word of God and he is flawless and he is a shield for all who take refuge in him. Beloved, that is wisdom. When we take refuge in God, when we don't rely only on the police to protect us, bless them, we're not against the police. Or the army, bless them, we're not against them. But we're not in the hands of the police and the army and the government as much as we are in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord, our Savior, our shield. He's, a, he's a, the, the, the guide through the Holy Spirit that guides us into all decisions of life. Praise his holy name. So don't leave home without that shield. James chapter 1 verse 25 says, But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Paul is restating in different words exactly what Jesus taught his followers. And Paul is teaching this, uh, no, uh, uh, James is teaching this to all of us right now. James is teaching us, that's the Lord's brother, he's his half brother, teaching it to us. Doing what he tells us to do will result in blessings. Praise God. And then point C, is Christian mentors. You know, I don't, I don't really want to name a whole lot of people that have been mentors to me, but um, uh, I think it's safe to name those that have, are, are dead and gone. Uh, like, for instance, David Newington was a mentor of mine. Uh, um, Sam Ennis was a mentor of mine uh, when I first got saved, although I was already about just about 40 years of age, but uh, Sam was only five years older than me, but he was, he was like a father figure in the Lord because he, he helped me to go from that I am a Christian mindset into a born again experience. You see, I grew up in so-called Christianity all my life. I would have expected a Christian funeral if I died. I would have expected the, 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 the minister to marry, marry us. I, I saw myself as a Christian, but I didn't have a born again experience. I was not really walking with the Lord. And I had mentors like Sam and us, uh, to bring me through and uh, mature me. And uh, so mentors like that are absolutely vital. But you know what? There are a whole lot of people that are still today are mentors to me. They, they might not even know it. There are people in this church that I see the way you live your life and it changes my life. You see, it's an example to me. You are a mentor to those that are around about you sometimes without even knowing it. And that's what I'm referring to as Christian mentors. People who love the Lord Jesus and that will help you to live your life in a better way. See, Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Boy, is that true. When you walk with fools, you will be a fool. You see, those guys that have fellowship with nobody, but they're drinking buddies and and they, they go and get drunk and they think they've had a good time except the next morning when they've got a hangover. But, you know, they are walking in foolishness. They don't even know that they are on the road to destruction. When you walk with fools, you will be a fool and you will suffer harm. I've had the privilege, as I said, of a number of mentors. I wonder about you. How many you have? Men and women of integrity that walk with the Lord Jesus. And they have greatly influenced your life. They impacted my life. 
They made me want to change. So then last Sunday, I quoted Paul uh, in the scripture. Uh, when he wrote to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, his second letter to the Corinthians, he said this, chapter 6 and verse 14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? You see, it's so important when we walk in our, the lives that we are in, that we select who you're going to walk with. I'm not saying you never have a relationship with an unsafe person. You might have to cut yourself off from your family to do that. Of course, we have relationships with unsafe people, but not the same kind of relationship that they are mentoring you. You should be mentoring them. You should be showing them the way to Jesus. You should be showing them through your lifestyle that there's a better way, and that is following Jesus, walking with Jesus. So you are a mentor to them. But the mentors in your life need to be people who lift you up and build up your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Point number two. When I trust God, I don't have to guess. You see, I know what I need to know. So we've gone into wisdom to a large extent. That's point number one today. And the others are nowhere near as, as important or, or as um, as lengthy but the other questions that i have today uh, like this one when i trust god i don't have to guess because i can go to god and i can ask him and he leads me and guides me you see proverbs chapter 17 and verse 24 says a discerning man keeps wisdom in view but a fool's eyes wander to the end of the earth you see when you have god's wisdom in view uh, then you are wise when you start to be influenced by everything you see around it, even the news, probably more than almost anything else that will lead you astray in this world, it's, it's the news. Uh, you know, I think the biggest liars in the world must be those that are higher for CNN. Uh, I, I don't know how they manage to, to get everything wrong. And uh, I don't want the, the news uh, on television to be my mentor or to guide me in my decisions of life. That's what I mean by fools' eyes wandering all over the earth. You know, they make you afraid of this and afraid of that. And, and they give you negative views all the time of all the people, particularly people that love the Lord. They will always be portrayed on television as fools or charlatans or people who make wrong decisions. That's how Christians will always be portrayed by the media uh, by uh, Hollywood and, and all those people. They will not give Christians a fair reflection of what God says about you. You are a child of God. So then the translation of that in a different translation says it this way. The foolish can never make up their minds. They don't know how to make up their minds because they don't know how to ask God. And so they, they're like a wave of the sea, tossed this way and that way. So then, when we ask for wisdom, <coughs> this is what James teaches us, going back to the book of James again, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So then the world's solution would always be different to God's solution. The world's solution is indecisiveness or fake confidence. You know, when I first became a salesman, I got into selling one of the most difficult things in the world to sell, life assurance. And my district manager took me on a sales training course. And this expert in the old mutual training course expert, this is what he had to say. He said, if you don't have confidence, fake it. Act as though you are confident. And slowly it will help you to become more confident. So you fake it. You see, that's the best the world has got to, ask, uh, to, to offer. If you don't have wisdom, fake it. Pretend that you are wise. And people will believe you. 
If you're not confident, people will believe you if you act as though you're confident. But with God, it's totally different. God says, if you come and ask me for wisdom, I'll give it to you. You don't have to fake anything when you are walking with God. You see, we need to humbly come to God in faith for wisdom. And that's all you need to do when you answer that question. When I trust God, I don't have to guess. In other words, I know for sure that God is going to give me that answer. Point number three. When we trust God, he acts on our behalf. Hallelujah. God acts on our behalf. Jesus, when he was on the way to raise that girl who died, a woman who had chronic bleeding came and touched the hem of his garment. You know the story so well. And, <coughs> excuse me, and she was healed. What did Jesus say to her? Your faith has healed you. What do you think you're saying? Did her faith heal her or did Jesus heal her? Well, it was a combination of the two. The healing was in Jesus. And if she had not come and touched him, she would not have been healed. The potential for healing was there. But the, the, the healing power that Jesus possessed only became active when she touched him. She had the faith to touch him. So you see, Jesus expects something from us other than giving of his virtue, of his power. He expects faith from us to believe, not to be like a wind, of the, like a wave of the sea, blown by the wind. We need to have faith in Jesus. You see, there's another uh, thing that I wanted to mention, and that was that at the same time, two blind men were walking after Jesus, following him, asking for healing. And, and Jesus turned to them and he said, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord, we believe. And so then Jesus said something to them. Not be healed. He said, be it according to your faith. According to your faith, will it be done to you? There again, Jesus is teaching us something. He wants faith from us. Don't ask him for direction if you don't believe he's going to give it to you. Don't ask for healing if you don't believe he's going to give it to you. He's, he's saying, I want your faith. I want you to believe that what I say I mean. Jesus said, ask the Father in my name and he will do it for you. So do we believe that? That's the part that Jesus wants from us. Faith. He wants us to believe. How many times have you been saved from danger because you prayed and trusted God? I wonder how many of you could give a testimony right now. I want to give you one that happened many, many years ago when we were still in our old building. Um, we, we uh, Eddie and Maureen and Mercy and myself and two other partners got into a business. We, we started, we bought a farm, uh, a guest farm, and we turned it into a camping center, come conference center. And uh, in order to help pay this off, we started another business, which was uh, agency business. So we were all salesmen. And uh, we each had an area of the country. And uh, Mercy and I had to stay on the farm and, and run the farm. And so I had a smaller area to cover selling for this other company than, for example, Eddie and Maureen had. Eddie and Maureen moved to Whitbank, and they did the majority of the Mpumalanga, I felt area, and I did the low felt. But I can remember while I was selling, uh, I had a combi in those days. And uh, I was traveling uh, in this combi to go somewhere, I think it was Sabi, and I was on a road. Uh, I can't remember exactly where the road was, but I know it wasn't a wide road. Uh, it was a narrow road, but the roads were quite narrow in those days. Even the main, main road going to, to Johannesburg was, was narrow. And if you got behind a truck, you stayed behind it for a long time. But anyway, I was traveling on this road, and I came to a hill. And as I went up the hill, I put my foot down to be able to keep speed up. The speed limit was 120, I think I was doing about 100. And I was going up this hill with my foot down and a, a truck came over the, the crest of the hill. But he was on his side of the road, no danger at all. As he came over, suddenly behind him, a car tried to pass him. And there was not room for three cars on that road. 
And this car came past him directly in line with me. You know, I prayed one of those short prayers, you know. Have you ever prayed it? Help, Lord! You know, there's nothing else. There's no time for more than that. You see, as I tell it to you, it seems like it, there was plenty of time to make decisions. Boy, this happened so fast. I mean, that guy's coming over at at least 100 kilometers an hour. That means we're approaching each other at 200 kilometers an hour, at least, if not more than that. And as he came over, my natural reaction, because I've done driver's licenses in Northern Rhodesia, in South Africa, in, in uh, the Cape Province. I've got, I've got a driver's license when I was 16 up in Northern Rhodesia. I, I had a driver's license when I was 18 in Johannesburg. I got another driver's license for a motorbike. And then I did a heavy duty license. So I've done lots of tests for licenses. And every one of them have taught me one thing. In South Africa, you drive on the left-hand side of the road. And so what's your natural reaction? You know, this guy's coming over at you. You pull to the left, but, but there's an embankment. And there's only a little verge. I can't pull over enough. And as I do that, he does the same thing the opposite way. And this guy actually went two wheels off the road and two wheels on the road. And between him and the truck was not enough room for a combi. No, Lord, I said. And I steered the car for that gap, which was too small. And God took my combi and made it the thin thinnest combi in the world. And I got through. And then my combi became normal again. I cannot think of any other way that I could have got through. Beloved, there was not room on that little road for a truck and two cars. There just was not enough room. God took me through. Do you pray every time you go somewhere? You know, I'm sure you do. Lord, give us traveling mercies. Do you believe it? Since that time, boy, I believe it. Every time I go somewhere in a car, I know God is with me. And God will help me. I don't know how many kilometers a salesman that we have done. Hey, Eddie, have you ever counted up how many kilometers you've done? 2.3 million. You see, he counts them. I don't. You know, but, but we were salesmen. You know, we, we've traveled extensively and God has kept us. God is with you. Beloved, when you trust God, he acts on your behalf. That's the point I wanted to make there. Point number four. When we trust God, he even uses our mistakes. I don't want to use too much time on this, but you know, in every circumstance of, uh, of our lives, you know the scripture, Romans 8, 28, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The Lord Jesus wants you and I to be his family, like our elder brother. That's how close he wants us to be. You see, I had, uh, I told you about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, a huge mistake that I made. And, you know, really, when I got that phone call, the, the guys, confident strictures are so clever. You know, there isn't even time to pray because the guy's on the phone and he's telling you that there's a problem with your account, that somebody is putting through amounts on your account. But don't worry, I can reverse it. And now I believe him. And I give him all sorts of information. And, and eventually, to make a long story short, he stole 48,500 Rand from me, which I don't have. So he pushed the, 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 my balance, my credit limit to its maximum. What a stupid thing to do. You know, now I know. I won't be caught that way again. But what has it done? You see, even in that circumstance, my son and daughter-in-law, came to us this weekend. They, they, they took a chance and they came up. They got our ID numbers or uh, copies of our IDs to show that we were old, infirm people and they needed to come and see us. And they got our proof of address and so they trusted that they would get through and they did. And they came and saw us. Why? So that he would lend me that money so that I wouldn't have to pay interest on it. And so I've destroyed and broken and killed that credit card. It no longer exists. I paid it off and I've told the bank I don't want another credit card. 
I'll use a debit card. And if I haven't got money in it, that means I haven't got money. But nobody's going to steal a credit limit of 50,000 Rand or something like that from me again. So, beloved, it was a huge mistake. But you see, when we trust God, he used even that mistake to establish a new kind of a relationship between us and our, and our son and daughter-in-law. And, and the closeness is even closer than it was before. And, and how you see the concern of other people for you and, and how that, that just melts you, you know. But it's just so wonderful that God will use even a stupid thing to build and to strengthen. Everything in your life can be used by God for positive effect. And so I want to conclude with that picture. And uh, what I want to say about that picture is that you can see it's a difficult road. It's not really for ordinary cars. It looks like a four by four or, or a bucky road. And we're going through that sort of road now with the coronavirus around the world. But if you look in the right in the in the in the far distance of that road, you see the light of how the light is there. And God is saying to us, you'll get through it. I'll be with you. Just to trust me. No matter how difficult things become, trust me. He will take us through it all. You see, there's a conclusion of once again, I'm going to go back to something that Rick Warren concluded his talk with. And that's just four little points. Number one, recommit our lives to Jesus Christ. And I think we need to do that every time we're in church. Recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Better still, do it every morning when you wake up. Recommit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, we express our gratitude to God through our giving. Now, that's not only money. I've mentioned about the, the tithes and offerings. You can put them in the box, but it's much more than, than your money. Giving yourself to God by helping others, by being what God wants you to be, by being a witness for Jesus, just to be what God made you to be. Giving yourself as opposed to being selfish. Number three, we discuss what we learn with friends and family. You see, you discuss it, sometimes you show it by your lifestyle. <clears throat> and that can be good enough. And number four, <clears throat> stay connected and help others, especially during this crisis. I mentioned at the beginning of our service today that there's a lot of people that could be in church. Look at all the empty chairs. You know, we can have 50 here. And there's a lot of people that are not on the, on the internet, not participating with us in any way at all. Members of this church, we need to encourage them. You know some of them. Encourage them. Try and get people coming back to church or getting online, one of the two, so that we can be connected. Being connected is the important part of what I wanted to say here this morning. And so those are the three things or four things that I wanted to conclude with. And as I said, I'm going to, before I even pray, I'm going to pray after we've done the next two choruses. And so I want you to stay and listen to these two and maybe to stand and sing with this first one in any event. The second one, there's no words, but I think you're going to know the words anyway. But let's begin with
Amen. Amen. Father, we just want to pray as we close the service today for you to just remind us that your wisdom is available whenever we face difficult decisions, whenever we have to make choices in life, that we have the privilege of coming to you and that you, Lord Jesus, will help us. You'll help us in everything that we need to decide, in every choice that we need to make, important choices and even small choices. You are with us. And through this difficulty of coronavirus, we ask you to be with all of our family, with all of our members and all of our extended families and all of our countrymen in South Africa and the people around the world. Lord, particularly your church, we pray for your church. Keep us safe, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve.